Saturn's rings are one of the most famous sites in all of astronomy. The rings look solid, but they're not. They're actually made up of millions of particles, all orbiting Saturn together. The particles are mostly ice and dirt. Some are as small as grains of dust. Others are large boulders. The rings are also razor thin compared to Saturn's bulk. This series of pictures was taken as the Cassini spacecraft moved from below the rings to above them. You can see how thin the rings are. When you compare their width to their thickness, it's about the same as a sheet of paper that's as wide as the city of San Francisco. Oh, and that little guy you saw shooting across the top was one of Saturn's moons. We'll talk about a couple of those in just a few minutes. Saturn's rings are mysterious. They're more than just belts of particles orbiting the planet. For example, there are spokes in them, as you see here. Some of them are even braided. Nobody expected these features in the rings, and some of them are still a puzzle. It's as if somebody created them just to delight and fascinate us. So how do the rings get there? I believe they were created at the same time Saturn was, a few thousand years ago. Of course, evolutionists won't accept this. Here's what a NASA scientist had to say about them. After all this time, we're still not sure about the origin of Saturn's rings, says Jeff Cousy, a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center. Cousy speculates that some hundreds of millions of years ago, the time when the earliest dinosaurs roamed our planet, Saturn had no bright rings. Then, he says, something unlikely happened. Yes, that's right. Here's Jeff Cousy again. A moon-sized object from the outer solar system might have flown nearby Saturn where tidal forces ripped it apart. Or maybe an asteroid smashed one of Saturn's existing moons. The debris encircled the planet and formed the rings we see today. Are you starting to detect a pattern in evolutionist explanations? Not all evolutionists take refuge in this, though. There's a report from NASA on Saturn's rings that I think is interesting. Here's what it says. Saturn's rings, age and origin unknown. Saturn defies evolutionary models in several ways. For one thing, its magnetic field doesn't match evolutionary predictions at all. As one article explained, Saturn dumbfounded planetary theorists who study dynamo models by having a highly symmetric internal magnetic field. A field that is symmetric about the rotation axis violates a basic theorem of magnetic dynamos. Saturn's magnetic field doesn't seem to be coming from a dynamo. This would be impossible if Saturn were billions of years old, as evolution says. But there's no problem at all if Saturn is only thousands of years old, as the Bible says. But there's an even bigger problem we need to discuss. A recent study took a closer look at the formation of Saturn and Jupiter. Remember that model of the gas and dust cloud that supposedly formed all the planets? Well, the study discovered that Saturn, and Jupiter as well, wouldn't be here today if that model was true. One report on the study described this model and then said this. These theories fail to describe the formation of gas giant planets in a satisfactory way. Gravitational interaction between the gaseous protoplanetary disk and the massive planetary cores causes them to move rapidly inward over about 100,000 years in what we call the migration of the planet in the disk. Theories predict that the giant protoplanets will merge into the central star before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Astronomers call this the migration problem. In plain English, Jupiter and Saturn would have both migrated inwards and slammed into the sun billions of years ago if that whole gas and dust story was true. Since we see Jupiter and Saturn today, obviously the gas and dust story isn't true. The report concluded this way. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. If the evolutionary model says that Jupiter and Saturn shouldn't be there, but they are there instead, I'd say that's more than a major challenge for the model. I'd say it falsifies the model completely, wouldn't you? We see then that Saturn creates huge problems for evolution. But we're not done yet. Saturn also has dozens of moons, some of which are fascinating. Let's look at a couple. This is Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons. Our first close-up pictures of Enceladus were beautiful, but nobody expected what would come next. When we started taking pictures from a different angle, we saw something unusual. This is Enceladus, below Saturn's rings. Do you see the faint smudge below the moon? A closer look reveals that Enceladus has a fountain coming out of its south pole. When the pictures were colorized to bring out invisible details, we saw that this wasn't just a little spray, it's a huge geyser. 
Evolutionists were, and still are, stunned by this. Evolutionary models can't explain it. The problem is that Enceladus is supposed to be billions of years old. It's supposed to have cooled off from its formation eons ago. It's not supposed to have the energy to do any of this. Also, we recently took a close look at some of the other moons of Saturn. We found out that Enceladus's neighbors are much brighter than they're supposed to be. Apparently, Enceladus is spray painting them with ice and snow. Evolutionary models say that Enceladus is old, cold, and dead. But it looks like it's none of those things. Enceladus is a great piece of evidence for a young solar system. Then there's Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. This is another great example of how over and over again, evolutionary theories have failed to explain our solar system. Titan is a very unusual moon. As you can see, it looks fuzzy. That's because it has an atmosphere. Titan's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, but it has some methane mixed in. That methane has caused all sorts of problems for evolutionary theories. You see, sunlight breaks methane down. Scientists have calculated that the methane in Titan's atmosphere could only last 10 million years or so, far short of the 4.5 billion years that it's supposed to be. However, there's still lots of methane there today. So, if Titan was really billions of years old, it would have two things. Number one, a source of methane to keep replenishing the atmosphere. And number two, a lot of ethane built up on its surface from all the methane that was broken down. Well, a few years ago, the Cassini spacecraft was sent to visit Saturn. It included a special probe to drop onto Titan and investigate this mysterious moon. Because evolutionists believe in billions of years, they confidently predicted we would find a deep global ocean of methane and ethane on Titan. One scientific paper predicted a layer of methane and other chemicals up to 800 meters thick. That's about a half mile deep. One of the leaders of the Titan project went even further. He said, this remarkable moon could be covered by a global ocean of ethane with an average depth of up to several kilometers. However, even before the probe arrived, scientists were taking a closer look at Titan from Earth, and they started to realize this prediction was wrong. Then, when Cassini's lander finally penetrated the haze, the truth was confirmed. Despite the evolutionists' expectations, there is no global ocean of methane and ethane on Titan. Titan's surface is dry. All we found is some dark areas on the surface, mostly near the North Pole. These look like lake beds, and it appears that at least some of them are lakes of methane and ethane. However, they're still grossly inadequate to fulfill evolution's requirements. As one recent study commented, even if the dark spots were all lakes of methane, the methane on Titan's surface would only be about one-tenth the amount in the atmosphere. This small amount would only last 10 million years at most, not 4,500 million years. And there's another problem too. Since Titan's surface is solid, according to evolution it should have thousands of craters if it was really billions of years old. Remember how I explained about the crater counting idea? As of the time I'm making this video, the crater counters have thoroughly gone over about 10% of Titan's surface. They haven't found thousands of craters. So far they've found four. Mm -hmm. Titan doesn't look billions of years old. Titan looks quite young. Titan might be just a moon, but it's a great demonstration of the failure of evolutionary theory. And as we prepare to leave Saturn, I have to tell you about one more thing, actually a pair of things. Here's another wonderful thing from our creator. You're looking at Janus and Epimetheus, two moons of Saturn. You might not think they look very impressive. The thing here isn't how they look, it's what they do. These are now called the dancing moons of Saturn. These two moons orbit Saturn in their separate paths, one on the inside and one on the outside. But then, every four years, they switch. The one on the outside moves to the inside, and the one on the inside moves to the outside. Isn't that wonderful? It's a silent, graceful ballet going on deep in space. This has to be precisely balanced in order to work. What are the odds of this happening by chance? I think this is a great testimony to our creator. So now we have to leave this part of our tour. Here's what you aren't being told about Saturn. Saturn, and Jupiter too for that matter, can have form according to the nebula theory from that cloud of gas and dust. Computer simulations show that both planets would have migrated into the sun billions of years ago. Saturn's magnetic field doesn't match evolutionary theories. Enceladus is young. Titan is young. And Saturn has dancing moons.
Saturn tells us that our creator is not only skilled, but he appreciates beauty. Uranus is the seventh planet out from our sun. It's so far away that it takes about 84 Earth years to orbit the sun once. Because it's so far away from us, we didn't know much about Uranus until the Voyager 2 spacecraft visited it in 1986. The Voyager discovered that Uranus defies evolutionary predictions in multiple ways. On the left, you see the planet as it appears to the eye. On the right is the planet with false colors added to exaggerate details. The spot you see here is the planet South Pole. Evolutionists had expected Uranus's poles to be on the top and bottom like all the other planets have. Instead, the poles are on the sides. It turns out that Uranus leans way over as it orbits the sun. All the other planets spin like a top as they go around the sun, but not Uranus. Uranus rolls along like a ball as it travels through space. Well, this creates a huge problem for evolution. According to the nebula theory, it's impossible for Uranus to have formed this way. Can you guess what the answer is? Yep, that's right. Uranus formed the right way up, as evolution predicts. But then an asteroid crashed into it and knocked it over. This was a really big asteroid, by the way, about the size of the entire Earth. But where's the evidence for this collision? There isn't any. In fact, there's lots of evidence that seems to be inconsistent with the collision. First of all, Uranus is quite stable as it rolls along through space. Its orbit around the Sun is almost perfectly circular. Plus, its orbit lies more closely within the plane of the ecliptic than any other planet besides Earth. Surely a massive collision wouldn't have produced such a perfect orbit. Also, Uranus has moons, over two dozen of them in fact, as you see here. Plus, it has a faint ring system. Notice that all these moons are orbiting Uranus's equator. Now remember, the equator is angled up and down, instead of sideways like the evolutionists expected. So where did these moons come from? They couldn't have formed before the collision because they wouldn't be orbiting where they are today. And they couldn't have formed after the collision because Uranus was supposedly already formed when the collision occurred. They couldn't even have formed during the collision because their orbits are too regular. They do not look like they were involved in any sort of collision like this. Here's what one scientist said about Uranus's moons. And by the way, this man won the Nobel Prize in physics. He said, to place the Uranian satellites in their present, almost coplanar circular orbits would require all the trajectory control sophistication of modern space technology. It is unlikely that any natural phenomenon involving bodies emitted from Uranus could have achieved this result. I think we should recognize that no collision occurred. Uranus was apparently created just the way it is. Uranus causes lots of other problems for evolution, too. First of all, Uranus is one of the four giant Jovian planets. The other three all generate energy. They radiate more energy into space than they receive from the Sun. Uranus is the only giant planet that doesn't do this. But why doesn't it? After all, these planets all supposedly formed at the same time, from the same materials, by the same natural processes. That means they should have turned out roughly the same. But Uranus is very different than the others in this important area. Another problem was discovered when Voyager flew by Uranus and measured the planet's magnetic field. Evolutionists had predicted that Uranus wouldn't have a magnetic field, but it does. Now, creationists weren't surprised when Uranus was found to have a magnetic field. Two years before the Voyager probe reached Uranus, Dr. Russell Humphreys, who is a Bible-believing physicist, had predicted the planet would have a magnetic field. Since the Bible says the Earth was made of water, Dr. Humphreys said, what if all the planets were originally created from water? That would have certain implications for their magnetic fields today, 6,000 years later. So he calculated approximately how strong that field would be today. And when Voyager reached Uranus and took measurements, the evolutionists were wrong, and the creation-based prediction was right. There's more we could say about Uranus if we had the time. But before we leave this planet, I have to share with you one of my favorite objects in the solar system. Uranus's moon, Miranda. Miranda is a tiny little moon. It's only about 300 miles across, but it's one of the strangest objects in the solar system. Pity the poor evolutionist who has to explain this thing. The entire moon looks like a patchwork quilt, like it was glued together from a jumble of different pieces. How many different types of terrain can you identify here? 
there's long strips of rugged terrain, side by side with terrain that's smoother but more heavily cratered. Here's another example. Look at how dramatically the terrain changes from one section to another. It really looks like the moon was assembled from a bunch of separate pieces. Some sections look like someone painted it with a giant paintbrush. Other sections have very dramatic terrain, with canyons several miles deep. Let's look more closely at that cliff on the right. This cliff is about six miles high. Imagine standing at the top and looking down. And what's with that big check mark anyway? It's almost as if the creator said, ha, let him try to explain this one. As one evolutionist said, no one predicted anything looking like Miranda. Another said, the central problem in modeling the thermal histories of the Uranian satellites is accounting for Miranda. So how do evolutionists explain Miranda? You're probably expecting me to say they explain it with an asteroid collision. Nope, not this time. Miranda is so weird, even the evolutionists admit that an asteroid collision won't help them. Instead, some evolutionists propose five collisions. Here's a quote from a NASA website. Scientists believe that Miranda may have been shattered as many as five times during its evolution. After each shattering, the moon would have reassembled from the remains of its former self with portions of the core exposed and portions of the surface buried. If this sounds like nonsense, it's because it is. Even other evolutionists recognize that this tiny moon wouldn't necessarily survive one collision, never mind five. As one evolutionary astronomer wrote, although some sort of collisional disruption appears to be required, it's not obvious that the present terrain, with relief up to 20 kilometers, would survive catastrophic disruption and reassembly. Maybe that's why that NASA website, after telling you about the five collisions, says this. Miranda's appearance can be explained by theories, but the real reason is still unknown. So first, they give you a theory, and then admit they actually don't know what happened. In other words, they made up the story and told it to you, even though they know it's not true. Wouldn't it be better just to acknowledge that these objects were created? So here's what you're not being told about Uranus. Evolution says it shouldn't be rotating sideways, but it is. Evolution says it shouldn't have its current magnetic field, but it does. Evolution says it should be radiating energy into space, but it isn't. And Miranda is a complete mystery. Neptune is the eighth planet out from our sun. It's so far out in our solar system that the light from our sun takes almost seven hours to reach it. According to evolutionary models, Neptune is old, cold, and dead. It's supposedly billions of years old after all. But unfortunately for evolutionary models, Neptune doesn't look either old, cold, or dead. First of all, Neptune isn't cold. Yes, it's a colder place than Earth. But our space probes have discovered that it's not as cold as evolutionists expected. Instead, the planet radiates into space about twice the energy it receives from the sun. Neptune isn't dead either. It turns out Neptune is a violent, turbulent place. It has the strongest winds measured anywhere in the solar system. We've measured wind speeds there up to 1,300 miles per hour. This is called the Great Dark Spot. It's a massive storm system roughly the size of Earth, or at least it was. A few years after this photograph was taken by Voyager in 1989, NASA took more pictures of Neptune with the Hubble Space Telescope. The new photographs showed that the dark spot has disappeared. Since then, a new one has been discovered in a different location. Neptune is a dynamic, ever-changing planet. Neptune looks neither cold nor dead. Apparently, it's not old, either. Neptune also confounds evolutionary theories with its magnetic field. We've seen that over and over again, the magnetic fields in the solar system have falsified evolutionary models. Well, Neptune is no different. We had a hint of the problem already, before our first spacecraft even reached Neptune. When Voyager 2 was on its way to Neptune, it visited Uranus first. I already told you that according to evolution, Uranus wasn't supposed to have much of a magnetic field, but it does. There was another surprise, though, that I didn't mention. Not only was Uranus's magnetic field much stronger than the evolutionists expected, it was also tilted and offset from the center of the planet. Evolutionists couldn't make sense of this at all. It doesn't match their models at all. So they scratched their heads and said, well, maybe Voyager flew by just as Uranus's magnetic field was reversing. This would have been very unlikely, although not impossible. 
But then, three years later, Voyager arrived at Neptune, and guess what? Neptune's magnetic field is also tilted and offset from the planet's center. Evolutionists were forced to acknowledge that it seems that the possibility of finding two planets both experiencing magnetic polarity reversals is small. So far, we've seen that Neptune has produced lots of bad news for the evolutionary model. But there's an even bigger problem that I haven't told you about yet. According to evolutionary models, Neptune can't exist at all. Here's how Astronomy Magazine explained it. Psst. Astronomers who model the formation of a solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the Sun. Bodies orbited so slowly in the outer parts of the Sun's protoplanetary disk that the slow process of gravitational accretion would need more time than the age of the solar system to form bodies with 14 and a half and 17.1 times the mass of Earth. Did you catch that? According to evolution, Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Well, last time I checked, both planets were still up there in the sky. Evolutionists are unhappy that their model is such a failure. As one evolutionary astronomer has commented, what is clear is that simple banging together of planetesimals to construct planets takes too long in this remote outer part of the solar system. The time needed exceeds the age of the solar system. We see Uranus and Neptune, but the modest requirement that these planets exist has not been met by this model. Let's ask an important question here. How long has this problem been known? Here's another evolutionist. There have been many attempts to model the evolution of a swarm of colliding planetesimals. Safranov calculated the characteristic timescales for planetary growth. In the terrestrial region, he found timescales of 10 to the 7 years, that's a one with seven zeros after it. But the time estimates increased rapidly in the outer regions of the solar system, and was 10 to the 10 years for Neptune, which is twice the age of the solar system. It is clear that in view of the large timescales found for the formation of the outer planets, a satisfactory theoretical model for the accretion of planets from diffuse material is not available at present. Okay, so this problem was first discovered by a scientist named Safranov. Was this a recent discovery? Nope. Safranov published this in 1972. So evolutionists have known for over 30 years that Uranus and Neptune can't exist according to their models. Did you hear about this in Time Magazine? Or in the newspaper? Or in a science program? I bet you haven't. In fact, I bet you've been told the opposite. I bet you've been told that evolutionists had the entire solar system figured out and that they know exactly how it all formed all by itself billions of years ago. Now you know that this is a falsehood. Here's a quote from another evolutionary astronomer. He says this, It's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. Come up with a scenario. That's a very interesting statement. In fact, it really reveals the heart of the matter. The goal of the evolutionist is to come up with a scenario about how everything got here without a creator being involved. Most evolutionists even seem to believe that just the act of coming up with a story proves it all happened that way. It doesn't even have to be a good story. Just look at what's going on with Uranus and Neptune. Instead of acknowledging their creator, evolutionists would rather cling to a story that denies the very objects it's supposed to explain. Evolutionists need to make up stories about how evolution could have made the planets. How much worse of a story could you come up with than one that says the planets can't exist? Uranus and Neptune prove that it doesn't matter how bad the story is. For the evolutionist, any story is better than acknowledging the truth about their creator. These planets reveal the truth about the creation versus evolution debate. This is not a debate about religion versus science. If it were, there wouldn't be any scientists who believed in creation. But there are hundreds of degreed scientists who do believe in creation. No, this is a debate about the authority of the Bible as God's word. The Bible explains the scientific data far better than the evolutionary model. Plus, the Bible's truth is supported by evidence from archaeology, geology, history, and many other sources. Not to mention that as the word of God, the Bible stands on its own authority anyway. But none of that matters to evolutionists. Evolutionists have rejected the Bible because they don't want to be accountable to a creator. They would rather believe a model that says the gas giant planets cannot exist. You can decide for yourself whose model is the better match for the scientific evidence. So here's what you're not being told about Neptune. It looks young, not billions of years old. It generates energy, 
It's changing constantly, and it has the most violent winds in the entire solar system. Its magnetic field defies evolutionary models. And the biggest problem is this. According to evolution, it can't be there at all. <laughs>